Welcome to Warriors for Christ podcast. I'm Sam, doing a recording from home. Kyle's not with me today. And uh, today we're going to get in and we're going to talk about the free gift of God. Now, you hear the free gift of God, you're like, hey, it's free. It's a gift. You just have to receive it. Well, what we're going to find out today is this free gift, it actually costs you everything. Absolutely everything. So let's open up in prayer and we will get started in God's word. Father, I thank you for today. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that you are a God that reveals your truth. Father, that you are a God of power, that you work miracles, signs, and wonders. And you still do that today. You have not changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And Father, I thank you that you continue to do impossible works and that there is power in the testimony of your Son and the true gospel message. Father, I pray as we go through your word today, it will become clear and evident to all those who are listening that this free gift, well, it's free in a certain extent, but on the other hand, it will cost us everything. Father, I thank you for your word. Bless this time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So this is actually the second time I'm recording this episode. I'd recorded it a week ago, and somehow the, the phone locked up on me near the end, and, and it froze, and so it didn't save the file. So I get to do this again. It's been a while, but we're going to pick it back up today. Now, a lot of times if you talk to people and you say, you know, what is this? Uh, what does it mean to come to God, and, and what's this good news gospel? A lot of people will say, well, it's a free gift. You see, with a gift, all the receiver has to do is accept it. It doesn't cost them anything. But if they don't accept it, then they don't get the benefit. And that's kind of the explanation that you hear when people say, well, gee, if God loves the whole world, right? Think of John 3, 16. If God so loved the world that he uh, you know, gave his son. And that whoever believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Now, a lot of people think of that passage, right? They're like, hey, all you have to do is believe. It's a gift. There's nothing you have to do. It's just a receiving. And we'll look at a couple other passages too. But just some things to point out when you look at John chapter 3, 16, right? So God loved, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever is believing in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Well, what's up with a might? What's up with a conditional? Uh, King James versions will say, Um, should not perish, but should have eternal life. It's a should. It's not a shall. It's a conditional um, verb in the Greek. Well, the reason why is some people have a faith that cannot save, a belief that cannot save. We we did an episode on you must believe and be baptized. Now, even if you were to continue to look through at John chapter 3, as you keep reading, it tells us who actually loves God and who doesn't? You see, in verse 19 of that chapter 3, if you keep reading, it says, This is judgment, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. Does it say they love darkness because that was their choice? You know, there's a lot of self-professing Christians today that would say, Oh, no, no, I don't love darkness. I love light. I love God. But they still have evil deeds. You see, if you still have evil deeds, God's going to accuse you of, no, you don't love me. You love evil. It doesn't matter what you say. In verse 20, it says, for everyone who is doing evil hates the light. If you still do evil, God's going to accuse you of hating the light. He does not come into the light so that his deeds will not be reproved. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been worked in God. It goes on in the final in verse 36. It says, He who is believing in the Son is having eternal life. But he who is not obeying the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, I wanted to point out this verse, you know, when you look at John chapter 3, the different passages, because a lot of people try to simplify the message and say, no, no, just believe. Well, it does start with belief. It starts with faith. That's, that's, that's the opening bid. But as we, we're going to find out today as we keep looking at Scripture, there's so much more than that. 
you know, as I, as I sit here thinking, right, you know, in First John, and we did a whole episode uh, on First John uh, chapter 1 and 2. You can listen to that in detail. But I want to highlight something because it, it points out the same theme. And it's important to understand as we get in and we talk today about this free gift that's actually cost you everything to understand some of these principles. You know, in First John, John's writing to a church. But he's writing to the first group of people who don't have fellowship. That's why in verse 3 of chapter 1, he says, We have seen uh, what we have seen and heard. We proclaim to you also so that you too might have fellowship. Did you catch that? He's writing to them so that they might have fellowship. They didn't have fellowship with God yet. He says, indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and is with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you so that our joy might be made complete. Because this first group of people did not have fellowship. But remember what we talked about earlier where he says, if you still do evil deeds, you hate the light. It doesn't matter what you say or what you think. Well, this church here in verse 6 of 1 John chapter 1, he says, if we say we have fellowship with him, with God, and yet walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. Because there are a group of people that are saying that. Now, even though he's saying we, which you might think he's talking about himself, he's not. That's how they talk during the time. Remember, John already established earlier that he does have fellowship. So he's not the liar and the truth is not him. And in him, it's the, the people who say they have fellowship and don't. Verse 7, if, all these are ifs, if we walk in the light as God himself is light, well, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. In chapter 2, verse 3, it says, By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. But people say, no, 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 but I have come to know him. Verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him, and is not keeping his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So it's important to, to know it's not what we think. The Bible talks about people who proclaim Christ and preach the gospel, and yet the Bible says they're deceived while they deceive others. They don't even know it. So it's important to understand. Now, uh, another passage, you know, when we think of the, the free gift, uh, a passage that comes to mind is uh, Romans chapter 6. You know, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You'd be like, well, see, there you go. It's a free gift. Now, from the standpoint of can you pay for your sins, we know that we can't pay for our sins. It has to be a holy sacrifice, unblemished sacrifice. That's why Christ died for our sins, to pay for them. But he paid for the sins of the whole world. Now, not the whole world benefits because not everybody receives this gift. Now, as you look at the gift in Romans, it talks about, in other places, it talks about the, it's called the gift of righteousness, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, when you look at Galatians. And it's a spirit that God wants to give us. It's a spirit that he wants to put in us. It, it's like later in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse, what is it, 13, um, uh, 12, Uh, 12 through 14, he says, So then, beloved or brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you are living according to the flesh, you will die. But if you're living by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For all those who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And and that's consistent with John chapter 3 when he says, Jesus says you must be born again. You must be born of water and spirit. Uh, If you're not born again of the Spirit of God, well, then you have no life in yourself. But back to Romans 6.23. If you sit there and you say, okay, the wages of sin is death. Yet most people would agree with that. But what does it mean the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? Now, if I were to ask people, instead of you explaining what you think that means, can you cite passages in in Romans chapter 6 that explains what that means or leading up? No, most, be can't. most people can't. Most people don't understand. You see, when you look at the wages of sin is death, it's, it's not just past sins. It's do we still continue to struggle with sin, to still live and dwell within us. 
And this gets in and is discussed through chapter, you know, six, seven, and eight. We did an episode on each of these chapters. We also did an episode on overcoming sin. You must be spiritually baptized and crucified. We go much more in depth in scripture. But I just want to point out a couple of highlights here of some of the false conclusions people are making of this free gift. And, and, and that's what we're talking about right now, the free gift aspect of what is free. But then we're going to get to where God says it costs us everything. Now, what does it mean the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? Well, the whole argument kind of started as you back up in chapter 5, verse 21. It says, um, or 20, chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, it says, The law came in so that transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the grace of God reigns through righteousness. Now, now, what do you think he means there? Through righteousness. Your righteousness? The righteousness of Christ? Now, this righteousness that it reigns through to eternal life, it has to involve Jesus Christ. But what does it really mean? Well, as you keep reading in chapter 6, he basically explains that you have to be spiritually uh, baptized and born again. And that when that happens, sin no longer reigns in your body. The one who's been spiritually baptized and crucified, in verse 6, it says, of chapter 6 of Romans, it says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be destroyed, so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. What does it mean to no longer be slaves of sin? He continues to say, He who has died is now freed from sin. Now, if, conditional if, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall live with him. So then it says, what's supposed to happen in our bodies in verse 12? Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its lust. Hmm. Sounds like sin's not supposed to be there anymore. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as a life from the dead and the members of your body as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over if you're not under law, but under grace. That's if you've transferred from under law to under grace. And then he makes an important statement in verse 15 and 16. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? It may never be. But what's the justification in the reasoning? Next verse, verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you're slaves to the one whom you obey? Either of sin, resulting in death. Catch that. If you still struggle with sin, results in death. Or obedience, resulting in righteousness. Oh, you see, when you receive the Spirit of God, the gift of God, it does a work. It frees you from sin. It puts to death sin, removes it from your life, so that you can now be obedient with the result of righteousness. Your members of your body no longer are slave to sin. He says, but thanks be to God, in verse 17, that you, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you've been committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You see in this theme about grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life? The righteousness it's talking about is whether or not your members are now slaves of righteousness. He goes in and contrasts the two lives. He says, And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Verse 19, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Just as you presented the members of your body to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now it's an imperative command, present your members as slaves to righteousness and sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. What fruit were you deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? The outcome of those things is death. You see, that's the old life. Verse 22. But now, having been freed from sin, that's if you have been freed from sin, and now enslaved to God, you have your fruit in sanctification, and the outcome of that life? Eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God is willing to give a free gift to his spirit. But the gift does something. It changes us. It changes us so that now we become a slave of righteousness. That life, righteousness, reigns through Christ to eternal life. The question is, do we have that life? Uh, One other passage, Ephesians chapter 2. Many people are familiar with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. 
Now, in this passage, it's one of the few places where you have the, the past tense of the word saved. Most other places, it's always the present continuous, something that where you are being saved. It's a hope of salvation until you, en- unless, you know, until you endure, if you endure to the end. And that's discussed several places. We cover that probably the best in the episode, Once Saved, Always Saved. God says, if you endure to the end. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, that no man may boast. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. Now, again, from the standpoint of God's Holy Spirit, it's his gift that he gives. Nobody can earn it. Nobody can purchase it. It's a gift that you receive in faith. But once you receive that gift, it then does something in your life. That's why it says we were created for good works beforehand that we should walk in them, that God created before the foundations of the earth. Now, as you continue to go through the rest of Ephesians, he talks about what that life looks like, whether or not you've become the new creation, whether or not you've been filled with all the same deity and fullness of God that Christ has. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to the episodes we did on Ephesians chapter 3, or really the whole chapter of the book, chapter 3, 4, and 5, and um, it will it will make sense as we go through God's word. Now, let's get to the part of the cost. So, from the aspect of the free gift, yes, it's something that God gives that only he can give. But to receive that gift, you can't do anything to allow God to give it to you from the standpoint of he had to, you know, he had to send his son to pay for your sin. But to receive the spirit of God, no, that actually cost you everything. Let's take a look at some passages of what Jesus taught. And We'll start in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 10, let's see, starting in verse 34. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus said, Do not think that do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now you're probably thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. What do you mean? Jesus did come to bring peace. What do you mean he came to bring a sword? Well, we did an episode on, you know, peacemakers inherit the kingdom of heaven. And you should listen to that to understand what does it mean to have peace. It's not peace with the world. It's peace with God. There's a distinct difference. And God's pretty clear and articulate in his word. And we go through all those passages that talk about that. Listen to that episode to find more on that. But we're going to keep reading here. And we'll get a little bit of insight in this one passage about what does he mean he didn't come to bring peace, uh, but actually a sword. Well, here's the application, verse 35. For I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Did you know that? God sent his son to bring a sword, a sword even to the family, so that the members of your own household will be your enemies. Verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, when you when you look at these passages, some people are like, what do you mean? Love Father more than me, members of a household being your enemies. Uh, Take up your cross, follow me. If you don't do that, you aren't worthy of me. You see, you cannot be Jesus' disciple. You cannot follow Christ and entrance into the eternal kingdom unless you're willing to take up your cross and follow after him. If you aren't willing to do that, you're in trouble. So, and and we're going to get more into this of what this means. What you're going to realize is everything of the world God hates, and God wants to change your desires. He wants to change your desires of the world. 
which includes possessions, uh, which includes the chasing after entertainment of this world, uh, which includes friendships, relationships that are not of God. Those don't honor God. You see, God changes us into a new creation. All those desires are going to be removed. But if you don't know that God's going to remove you, then he can't help you. Turning over to Matthew chapter 16, uh, looking at verse 20 to 27. Then Jesus warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, be killed, and raised up on the third day. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began rebuking him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Now, one of the things a lot of people don't realize is they think the disciples had a saving faith when they were with Christ. And they didn't. You see, even though they went out and they were proclaiming the kingdom of heaven had come, they still didn't understand. We did an episode, Don't Be Like the Disciples, before they received the Holy Spirit. You see, here's a simple question for you. How could Peter believe in the good news that Jesus came to die for the sins and to invite Gentiles into the fellowship with God when he's telling Christ that he cannot die he, that he will actually prevent his death. Well, that sounds like somebody that's trying to prevent the work of Christ to redeem the whole world. That's what that sounds like. You're going to tell me that that person understood the gospel message. They understood what Christ was supposed to do, that Jesus was supposed to die for the sins of the world. No, no, he didn't understand because he had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Now, was the Spirit of God working? Yes, it's always working in darkness. Was the Spirit of God instructing here and there? Yes, but the time had not yet come for him to be perfected. So it's important to understand that. As a matter of fact, he accuses them again of being Satan, completely against the plan of God. Let's keep reading verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father and his, his angels and will then repay every man according to his works. Did you see what it cost you? It cost you your whole life. It cost you your whole life. Are you willing to deny your life? Deny self, all the desires of the world? Are you willing to pick up your cross and suffer like Christ that we covered in the true grace of God? Stand for a minute. The churches aren't preaching today. Are you to follow him daily? You see, until you understand and are willing to make that sacrifice and come to God and knowing that that's what he's going to do in your life and change you into the new creation, filling you with all the deity and fullness of God, then God can't do the work. Because your faith is not in cooperation with what God wants to do to your life. He wants to remove your old desires. He wants to remove the sin and the sinful thoughts that still dwell within you. That Jesus teaches that that is what actually defiles a person. Continuing to look at scripture. Let's turn over and look at some passages in the book of Luke. Starting in Luke chapter 9. Let's see. Uh, Luke chapter 9. Let's look at verse 23 and 25. And Jesus was saying to them, 
If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Again, a same consistent message. It will cost you everything. Uh, Later on, as you keep reading the book in verse 57, it says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. You see, the person is confessing with their mouth. They're believing and they're saying, as a matter of fact, I will follow you anywhere, Jesus. This person didn't really understand. Jesus said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the nest have air, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then Jesus says to another man, Follow me. But this man says, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Now most people are thinking, Well, that seems like a reasonable request. Yeah, go bury your father. My father just died. Do you know what Jesus' answer, his reply is? Jesus said to the man, Allow the dead to bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. A lot of people don't realize when he said allow the dead to bury their own dead, he's referring to those that are spiritually dead. You see, the world grieves for those who are dead and they have no hope. They don't understand. They're spiritually dead. Jesus said, let those who have no understanding, those spiritually dead people, let them be concerned with burying the dead. But you, no, you go proclaim the kingdom. Many people can't understand that, especially if they've lost a loved one. Probably because the thoughts and the feelings that they had were feelings of the world, not true feelings of God. As you keep reading in verse 61... Another person came up and said, Lord, I will follow you, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Remember earlier that Jesus said the members of a family will be your own, and your enemies will be the members of your own family? Well, when you're more concerned about and your desires and your attractions are for your family, and this is assuming families that, you know, people that don't know God. Well, there's a problem. Jesus' response is no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. You know, I've, I've, ta- I've had discussions with several people, and I've, I've you know, one time I was praying because they said, Sam, I, I believe in the message. I believe in the new heart and the Holy Spirit. I believe everything that you say. I'm willing to lose everything. I just don't understand why... I, God hasn't changed all my desires and cleansed me of all sin. So I prayed, and God revealed to me um, a passage in Luke to read. We're going to cover that next here in Luke chapter 14. And in that passage, it talks about, you know, unless you hate, right, father, mother, similar to the one that we read in Matthew. And um, I asked the person, I said, do you have any, uh, anyone significant in your life? friend, you know, brother, sister, mother, father, relative, just somebody who you're, you have a deep, deep relation, you know, fellowship with. And they, they said, yes, this, this uh, person that they had that they were planning on, you know, getting married, uh, which I didn't know about at the time. And this actually happened a couple times. And um, the, the most recent one was, was with a man and, you know, we actually had a, quite a long conversation. It went on several months because I said, well, you have to be willing to let go of that person because God's going, when he changes you, he changes all your desires. You're going to have absolutely zero feelings for that person. I know right now you'd probably feel like if you had to give up that person, you, you're feeling like, right, you're losing, you know, half your soul, right, because you're like knit to that person. And, but I said, when God changes you, he does an impossible work. He removes all those desires. It doesn't change your mind. You, you still have your, you, your, from like your memory. You still remember things, but your desires will be completely gone. 
And praise God, last week this person was um, freed. He came before God and was willing to lose everything, including that relationship. And God, when he made that confession, God took away all his desires for that person. Now, he still has a desire for that person to, to come to Christ, but God freed him from all those desires and the things that are, not, that are still of the world. That relationship, even though the person was a professing Christian, did not have the Spirit of God. And so God removed every desire for that, for that uh, other woman. Now, the other thing that God does, too, and what he did with the, the, this man is he, he freed him from uh, other sufferings that he had of depression and anxiety. The man is freed. He doesn't need the prescription medicines that he had been taking prescribed by the doctor. Nope. God freed all of that. Everything. God does perfect works. Uh, so praise God. Uh, let's see. So we just finished Luke chapter 9. Let's go look at Luke chapter 14. And this is, uh, you know, one of the passages I want to cover that, re again, continues to reinforce this message. And Luke chapter 14, we'll go verse 25 to verse uh, 33. Now, large crowds were gathering along, or were going along with, with him, Jesus. And he, being Jesus, turned and said to the crowds, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now think about it. You're probably sitting there going, wait, wait, wait. I thought Jesus did the cross for us. That's why I don't have to. No, no, he showed us the way. Again, if you haven't listened to the episode, The True Grace of God Stand Firm in It, or, or Suffering, and what God says about suffering, you need to listen to that. It's only somebody who's able to walk as Christ walked with the same power of God and overcome that has the Spirit of God and is led by the Spirit of God. Those are true sons of God. But all this of the world, no. You have to be willing. When God changes you, you will be able to do these things. When God changes you, you will be able to endure. The question is, did you ever know that that was the cost? Did you ever know that God was going to change your desires so that you won't have the same love for your father? You won't have the same love for your mother. You won't have the same love for your children, your siblings, your spouses, whatever it is. God changes your desires. And where the, the sword really comes in is when you start pleading with people who think they're Christians. That really brings a sword. The other thing is when you start having no desire to do the things and continue to chase the entertainment of the world. Because the other people still have a desire and attraction for that. They'll accuse you of seeking to try to spend too much, too much time with God or tell the world about Christ. I think of uh, 1 John chapter 2. Uh, it talks about the love of the world. I think it's in verse 15. Uh, I'll, I'll just say it. It's, it's do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, that's not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world is passing away in all of its desires. But whoever is doing the will of God, he, that person, will live forever. A love of the world and a desire for those things, you make yourself an enemy of God. Back to Luke, continuing on here in chapter 14. He then says in verse 28, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Did you see that? There's a cost. Did you count the cost? Did you know how much it's going to cost? Otherwise, verse 29, when he's laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe him begin to ridicule him. This is the person that wasn't able to endure to the end. And partly because they didn't understand the full cost. Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or verse 31. 
For what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, does not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000 men? It's the same thing. It's the principle of war. You have to understand and count the cost. Now, in this case, the cost to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit of God, God already paid the price for us to receive the Spirit. But you now, to receive it, must be willing to lose your life and give up everything. Everything. All the desires of the world that includes possessions and people. You're willing to do that. It says in verse 32, Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, verse 33, None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Now, you know, as I talk about these things, you know, giving up all your possessions, giving up all your relationships, you have to be willing to give those to God. God then has the freedom to choose what he gives back. Are you willing to take that risk and gamble? Now, for me, God changed me. Right now, my wife has chosen to to be hostile to God and hostile to me. Although she believes she serves God, but not the true living God, not the God of power. It creates division. I was willing to give up God everything. I said, God, do whatever you want with me. If you want to send me here, send me there, I will do absolutely anything. God has kept me in the same position. He didn't change my career path, but I live with a different purpose in life. My children, my desire for them is that they find God teaching and instructing them. But your desires towards things is just so different when God changes it. Another passage in Luke. Uh, Let me back up to Luke chapter 12. And Luke chapter 12, uh, verse, let's see. We'll go verse uh, 49 to 53. Uh, Jesus says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. See that? Jesus came to cast fire upon the earth, and even when he was here, he was wishing that it was already kindled. Verse 50, But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on the earth? I tell you, no. But I came rather for division. For now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. See that? Again, it's, it includes relationships. People, you must understand that. This is seem, seeming foreign to you. Well, it's probably because you don't have the Spirit of God. And you probably still struggle with sinful thoughts because you haven't been completely freed. I'm sure God's working around you. He just he hasn't yet gotten inside of you. Earlier in uh, Luke chapter 10, kind of moving backwards, in verse 25, a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus is going to tell him. It's kind of similar to what we've been talking about. Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? Notice how Jesus pointed him to the law. Verse 27, And Jesus answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, then Jesus said to him, you know, that, or that's what the man said. The man answered and said, you shall love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus answered him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now, as you continue reading, this person didn't understand So Jesus goes and tells him the story about the Samaritan. Um, 
Now, a lot of people also don't understand what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. We did a really good four-part episode on love the greatest commandment. I'll give you the short answer, but you can listen to that for all the scripture. To love your neighbor as yourself isn't what people proclaim. In, in the church, they'll say, well, you do good to others. That's actually the imperfect definition of what it means to love. Uh, the you know Sinners and the devil, they do that. They do good to other people. But they still do wrong. The love, love definition that God gives, uh, in one of the places in Romans chapter 13, verse 8 through 12, is he says, love does no wrong. You no longer sin against your brother or your neighbor. That's why it fulfills the law. A uh, similar answer in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, we'll read verse uh, 18 through 30. And in Luke chapter 18, a ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Kind of the same question that he had earlier in the previous you know, chapter, in chapter 10. And here, Jesus answers and says to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. So basically, Jesus is given the same answer that he gave before, that, or that the other man gave that he agreed with. So the man says, all these things I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, ah, one thing you still lack. Sell all you possess and distribute to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. See, it's this losing thing. Now, as you keep reading, the man is disappointed. See, Jesus knew the condition of his heart, and also this person thought he was keeping the commandments. He didn't truly understand what it meant to love God from the heart, and he didn't understand that God requires the perfect love, which fulfills the laws, a love that does not sin in the thoughts. And this is discussed more in chapter 5 of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. When he defines, if you have the anger of man, you still have lust in your, in your heart for a woman. You're in a murder, you're an adulterer question is, can your righteousness surpass that law of the, Pharisee, the scribes and the Pharisees, which is an outward law, not the law of the heart, which changes your thoughts? We covered more of that in the heart, or uh, the New Heart, New Spirit episode. Continuing on here in Luke chapter 18, so the man uh, became very sad because he was extremely rich. Verse 24, Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, the disciples were astonished. In verse 26, they say, when they heard it, they said, Then who can be saved? Jesus said, The things that are impossible with people are possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. You know, it's similar to you know the people I talk to and say what God's going to do. After he does it, it, they're always amazed. And they say, they say, it was just like you said. It was just like you said. I said, well, I know that's because that's what God says. Of course it is. But until you experience it, it's almost impossible to even think. It truly requires a leap of faith. So then Peter, in verse 28, says, Behold, we have left homes. We have followed you. And they did. Go listen to when... Um, the, Jesus called the disciples, what choice they had to make. Verse 29, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses, who has left wife, who has left brothers, who has left parents, who has left children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much in the present age, and in the age to come, eternal life. So you who are listening, what house have you left? What spouse have you left? What brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom? Are you starting to understand the cost? And again, referring to left, it's your desire. God removes your desire for those things. I still am responsible to raise my children. I have... You know, one boy in college, another one getting ready to start, and a daughter in high school. They don't have Christ dwelling in their heart. I didn't leave them and kick them to the curb. I'm still responsible to support them and raise them up in the way that they should go so that they'll learn and accept and then not depart from the truth. But my heart and my desire and my relationship with them is completely different than it was when I was a father that did not have the Spirit of God. God changes everything. 
a completely different relationship. You know, and in the end, when it all comes down to it, when God changes you and you're willing to give up everything, you end up becoming a doer. You end up becoming the person who can overcome. And so with that, maybe I'll end in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, we did an episode on each chapter. It was the very beginning episodes that we did, what, like two years ago when we first started, like the first five episodes or six episodes. Uh, all but the second episode we did was all originally on the book of James, chapter by chapter. So in James chapter 1, talks about count it all joy, beloved, when you encounter various trials or temptations. Knowing that the proof of your faith, that's right, it should be proof of your faith, it's a noun, is producing endurance. That's what a proof of faith does. It overcomes. Verse 4, imperative command, endurance must be having its perfect result. That's the work that God does. It's not your endurance. It's the proof of God's endurance in you. So that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's right. A perfect result. So that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And it goes in and talks about those who still lack what they must do. Then talks about how God gives perfect gifts. In verse 19, he warns them. He says, This you know, my beloved brother, and everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve or cannot work the righteousness of God. Then he tells what this person's problem is, this brother's problem. Verse 21, he says, Therefore, put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. He gives the imperative command and humility. He commands them to receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. This brethren had not yet received the word implanted that could save their souls. Verse 22, he then says, But become doers of the word. He commands them to become doers. They still were not doers. And not hearers who deceive themselves. They were still deceived. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at himself in a mirror and he goes away. And once he looks, he's immediately forgotten what type of person he was. Verse 25, the one who looks intently at the perfect law. Not just the perfect law, this law of liberty, but abides by it, walks in it. Not having become the forgetful here, no, that's the one that deceives themselves, but this man is now an effective doer. This is the man that will be blessed in what he does. If you thank yourself to be religious, if you cannot bridle your tongue, you deceive your own heart. God says your religion is worthless. The question, as he continues to stay, is the pure and undefiled religion of God with respect to yourself, is are you able to keep yourself unstained by the world? If not, that's probably because you still struggle with sin. You probably haven't come to the wisdom of God. In chapter 3, he warns that there's two types of people in the world. Chapter 3, verse 2, talking to the first group, he says, We all stumble in many ways. That's one group, the one who continues to stumble. Jesus talked about the man who continues to stumble. Their whole body will be cast into hell. But he goes on to say in verse 2, If anyone does not stumble... And what he says, oh, he's a perfect man. That perfect man is able to bridle the entire body as well. See, he doesn't have the worthless religion. He's not deceived in his heart. He can bridle his tongue and the entire body. As it goes on in verse 13, he challenges their wisdom. He says, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you still have jealousy, if you still have selfish ambition in your heart, stop being arrogant and, and stop lying against the truth. 
This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. This wisdom is earthly, natural, and demonic. For with jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder and every evil thing. He then goes on and talks to them about what corals, the fact why they have corals in chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of corals and conflicts amongst you? Is not your source your pleasures that wage war in your members? He goes on to say in verse 3, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Verse 4, he accuses them, you adulteress. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Whoever wishes to make himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And then God tells him what they need to do. And if you're listening, if this hasn't happened, if you have not lost your life, if you have not counted the full cost and understood, but now you know what it is, well, now you can get that thing which God always desires that he wants to give. He wants to give a free gift to you. It's his Holy Spirit. But it will cost you surrendering your life and giving up everything. Verse 5, do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? God jealously desires the spirit which, which he has made to dwell in us. Verse 7, imperative command, submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Imperative command, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Some of you who are listening think you've already done that. But if you're still a sinner and you have to confess your sins every night, that has not been done yet. You still need to ask for it. You need to believe in faith and the impossible work. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray, O oh God, that people who are listening, they would understand that there is a cost. It costs them their life, everything. Are they willing to surrender all? Possessions, family, friends, relationships, everything. Are they willing to lose their life? Are they willing to deny self? Are they willing to pick up their cross daily, their cross, follow, suffer, just as Christ suffered? As you tell us in Peter, that we have been called for this purpose, since Christ suffered for you, leaving for you an example for you to follow in his steps. And then tells us what that is, to commit no sin, to have no deceit in our mouth, to not revile, to not utter threats. Because Jesus bore our sins on his body on the cross so that we now, being dead to sin, might live to righteousness. Continues in 1 Peter, remind us again, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same purpose because the one who has suffered in the flesh has ceased or stopped from sin so as to live the rest of their life no longer for the desires of men, but now they live their life for the will of God. And just as you also tell us towards the end of 1 Peter, those who also suffer according to the will of God, they are the ones that can entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is good. We thank you, Father. I thank you for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.